I want to welcome all of you to part two of NAOP's two-part symposium on Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. Now, NAOP, I hope all of you know what that means, but in case you don't, we are the National Association for Olmsted Parks, and our mission is to further the Olmsted legacy through research, education, and outreach. The organization was started in 1980. We encourage scholarship. We publish key reference materials, support park restoration, and provide technical assistance to preservation efforts. In case you missed them, there are membership brochures at appropriate locations. Now, Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. Uh, is what we call the second or the third of the Olmsteads, depending on how you count age. But this symposium has been great for me as a board member because I barely knew who this man was. I knew a lot about his half-brother because I'm from Seattle and that's where he did most of the work. But the American West, where we are now, is a place where FLO Jr. had a tremendous impact the national park system, the underlying legislation, Yosemite, the California state parks, conservation of the irreplaceable redwoods, the East Bay Regional Park District, and on and on. In order to make this symposium succeed, we have recruited and enthusiastically have the support of many sponsors. Our partners at the National Building Museum, where we had our first part of the symposium in October or September, the East Bay Regional Park District, the Stephen and Margaret Gill Family Foundation, um, the true heirs of Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., the American Society for Landscape Architects, the Keenan Land Company, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, PG&E, Wells Fargo, Save the Redwoods League, and the California State Parks Foundation. I also want to thank our territorial hosts right here at Stanford, the Stanford Heritage Services, the Bill Lane Center for the American West, and the Conference Services for their support uh, both today and in the tours that will happen tomorrow. And finally, our longtime partners, the National Park Service. So I'm welcoming you on behalf of NAOP, and I'm now going to introduce Wayne Quinn, who chairs the board of the National Building Museum, uh, where the first part of our conference took place last fall. And we're happy now to have him here to kick off part two. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks, Chris. It's nice to see the lights to begin. That's wonderful. That's, I haven't seen it in several days. It's been raining, so anyway. Um, good, good morning to all of you. It's great to see you. Uh, yes, my name is Wayne Quinn. I, I live in Washington, D.C. I practice law there in the area of land use. Um, you, you know there are lawyers there, but not many of them practice in, law use, in, in land use, so that's good. Um, but I also have the pleasure of serving as, as Chairman of the National Building Museum's Board of Trustees. <clears throat> I'm really delighted to be here today um, to learn more about Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. Uh, frankly, I was always confused about which Olmsted did what. And then I finally figured it out by looking at their lives, lifespan, and realizing that, um, that the first Olmsted died in 1903. Uh, and the Macmillan plan was just about that time getting started in Washington, so uh, things started falling together. When the association approached us about oh, several years ago about the seminar, we were just delighted because our mission at the museum is identical in many ways, um, which many of you don't know that, that our museum was chartered by Congress in 1982. Um, and is the, the country's only cultural institution that is supposed to educate the public on the entire building industry. In fact, the legislation says 
from prehistory to future. And when you think about that, you know, it covers everything, everything, all, and even today. So um, our mission as, as part of the building industry and educating people it includes architecture, landscape architecture, economics, engineering, everything that has to do with the building industry. And so this is an aspect of it today that we are very excited about. Our staff spends, uh, and our board, spend almost every day interfacing with the built world, trying to figure out how we can better educate adults, children, uh, and the entire community on what the building industry does and the good things about uh, planning. Many of us indeed spend a large part of our professional life uh, chasing the same tail, basically loving uh, to see how, how buildings are built, how plans are made, and what makes us feel good. And I think that's one of the aspects that you'll learn today about Olmsted Jr. Um, and that's what Olmsted himself did in his professional career, made it such an exciting part of life, and his contribution is, is to be measured today a lot. The, the symposium has brought together many experts uh, throughout the United States to explore his legacy, and Olmsted Jr. is often thought of, uh, not known so well as I said earlier, but he's in the shadow of his father a lot, but, and not known uh, outside the profession a lot. But I wanna just point out three things that to me, um, and there's so many more, uh, but at least three things that, that make it him so important. One is establishing the profession, the profession of an urban planner, and he as was the first, one of the founding members of ASLA, represented here today. Um, playing, he played a critical role in the design of many of our major cities, Washington, D.C. being a major one, which includes, of course, the mall, our Federal Triangle, the whole area around Union Station under the McMillan plan. He came in just as his father, who was ill at that point, uh, and took over the plan business and really ran with it. And thirdly, he's always integrated the place of parks in urban areas and in and suburban areas and the meaningful uh, connection between people and how they live and how they can live better. So we applaud the association for recognizing uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. There ought to be some, some I, I like Flo better and I'm gonna say something that may, don't take offense at it, but I was thinking about calling um, FLO, you know what that stands for, and JR, you know what that stands for, but it seems to me that Flo Joe would be the best way to say it <laughs> because it picks up momentum, you know, mojo. So that's what I would refer to him as, but I don't wanna be disrespectful, so. Um, the tours today, tomorrow, and the program today will show that he was a visionary leader and a man who was very personal in his uh, delight in, in designing the environment. <clears throat> I'm quite certain by, that by the end of the day today, you'll have a better understanding. And I thank you for inviting me today. Uh, and I hope that when you're in Washington, you'll come to the National Building Museum, see our ongoing programs, uh, enjoy the atmosphere of our building, the old pension building, um, also, we are on, well, come to our shops there, too, and buy. Uh, if you use our uh, NBM, National Building Museum, org, you have a place to go right today and buy things from the museum. But you can also see our programs and how we interface with this program today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Doyle, uh, General Manager, East Bay Regional Park District. Welcome to the rainy Bay Area. I think there are just too many Seattle people here today. Um, but we're glad to have the Seattle weather once in a while since we've had such an incredible drought in California. So uh, don't drink a lot of water at your table. You'll be rationed. Um, it's a pleasure and honor, honor to be here today. The, the 150 years span of planning landscape architecture and conservation by both Umsteads, both senior and junior, is an influence and legacy that hasn't been matched anywhere across the world. And I think uh, separating out and focusing on Umstead uh, Junior, I, uh, maybe it's Flo Joe, I would 
prefer to call him Professor Olmsted since uh, he was the first landscape architecture uh, department chief at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, the beginnings of landscape architecture, many more, many people know much more than me, but I do, did read that when he was invited to run the landscape architecture department in Harvard, they didn't have one. They actually had to get the money to build a building to, to house him. And I think that's a fitting kind of start for the whole legacy of both Olmsteads and particularly Junior. The challenge of creating parks, planning parks, has also been a challenge of, of raising money along the entire way. And I'll talk more about this this afternoon, but uh, it was William Penmont Jr. who was our director, became state park director, and the national park director. And he, he called the art of raising money for parks, squeezing water out of rocks. And uh, I think uh, throughout the history of both Olmsted Senior and Junior, it was always a challenge, including the beginning of the National Park Service, to get any money out of Congress, to get money to uh, raise funds for projects, for planning, and for infrastructure. Um, and I think they have had through that legacy of years that tenacity to stick to it. And I think that's one of the things that any young planner, any landscape architect, any firm trying to run a business, get a plan paid for, is always thinking about how we're going to pay the next bills. And a lot of what you'll hear today is going from project to project in a, in a historical reference to what did they do next. And a lot of that, what did they do next, was to find the next job uh, because the other job either fell through or they were uh, not paid at times. Nevertheless, uh, the Olmsted firm has an unparalleled success story across this nation. And I think one of the things that we will really see today, and we will focus a lot on conservation and landscape conservation, the beginnings of the state park in California, the beginnings of the National Park, park Service, there is a thread between Olmsted Sr. and Jr. of conservation of good professional planning, and of promoting the vision and integrity of, of the business and of landscape preservation. I can think of uh, no other people that had so much integrity throughout their in careers and keeping the vision and keeping the, the philosophy of parks to their standard. Many of the quotes you may hear today is, above all else, remember to protect the scenery you were here to plan for. And I think that is consistent thread through all of uh, the projects that they did. But welcome to the West, welcome to the Bay Area. And uh, you will hear today um, that in addition to these large landscape scale park systems, um, that Olmsted Jr. and the firm in the second generation uh, plan parks in, in even cities and city elements in Berkeley, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Santa Barbara, the Palos Verdes Estates, um, and private estates throughout the West. They also surveyed and dig park plans from the edge of Canada down all the way to Los Angeles, um, and that really is a remarkable achievement. So I think uh, one of the things that uh, was apparent from looking through the history of both our East Bay Regional Park District, which is our 80th birthday this year, and we're very proud to both be a sponsor, and I want to thank our board of directors for allowing us to be a sponsor here. But also, you will see from the beginning of the park movement that there were issues. Uh, things like uh, controversy and outside influence, a lack of funding, a lack of public funding, um, rejection, uh, the the effort of politics to influence plans. And what's really nice is after 150 years, that has disappeared completely today. <laughs> so again, I welcome uh, you all here today. Have a good time. I hope you'll be inspired. I hope you'll remember that sometimes plans uh, take more than uh, just to plan on a piece of paper. They take inspiration and tenacity. And you have no better examples than uh, the Olmsted firm. Thank you.